And we're uh, we're on for the first one. I'll have to learn to look at the webcam to make sure to engage. <laughs> uh, yeah, laser focus. It's like I want to look at the screen, and that's it. But uh, yeah, so the idea for the podcast was, or at least the topic was, uh, basically things that inspire you. And so um, it can be, I feel like that can take a really large uh a range of topics which is what i like i like to kind of be able to spread and go on tangents and 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 see different views and angles on things so um with the inspiration it's it's broad enough that i think we can get some good discussion out of it at least um and starting that off i don't even know if this is necessarily something that's inspiring but it's something that's interesting to me and that's uh like competitiveness Mm and like kind of what role that plays in a healthy life and how that can push you uh to better heights essentially yeah. um yeah and so because my, okay, my wait, hold on is, hold yeah. on one thing technical thing wait, on technical me. technical just take your mic and maybe move it like right here because i hear a lot of air into your mic just give it a little distance okay there it's you pretty, go that's it's pretty sensitive i think i could have it even back here and it would be good yeah, I can still hear you pretty good. Okay, cool. keep talking now. You're good. Yeah, no, so a lot of it comes from uh, so playing like competitive card games and whatnot. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of, I've kind of been learning a lot about the competitive process and how much that actually uh, will, will drive um, kind of like growth and it'll drive a lot of other good aspects that not only enhance your life, but then bring you to bring you new insights that you might not have otherwise had yeah. and new, new ways of thinking. And that's kind of spurred on by the competitive spirit, I, I would say. Mm. And so have you had any experience with competitive uh, spirit or any sort of activities in your life? Yeah. I mean, it's easy to think of competition in terms of sports, but then I think mm-hmm. also competition in terms of the workplace too. And I don't know. I mean, I can think of competition in a way that really provokes you to do your best and Mm -hmm. makes you get ambitious about something. Like if I have to try to accomplish a goal and there's no deadline to it, there's nobody else who's maybe gonna do it better, there's no consequences to it, then it's likely Mm -hmm. that I'm going to procrastinate, I may not actually do that goal, oh, I don't know if it's really that important. If I do it, maybe I won't do the best job. But then if I'm really trying to be competitive with it in some way, whether it's against other people or just a deadline I put to myself or there's some kind of consequence to it, right? Then I'll definitely work harder and I'll wanna do my best for it. I think it's hard to be self-motivated enough to accomplish something well without Mm -hmm. some type of competition to like egg you on to do something better. I think the only danger for me when it comes to competition is if I get too comparative towards other people like in business if it's like oh other people are are better than me i'll never be the best you know Mm -hmm. then i think that's where yeah it's like other people are out competing me and Mm -hmm. and then i lose sight of maybe the goal of trying to help people or just support myself make ends meet i get so competitive that it's like i want to win and those people have to (laughs) lose and then it's like comparison is the thief of joy you know i think that's like a Mm -hmm. a way that competitiveness can almost get too uh like unhealthy it's like ooh, that wasn't the right way to compete you know so that's my two cents on that yeah i think that's good yeah i know that makes a lot of sense and i think kind of the word i was trying to use earlier was balance and Mm -hmm. so if you're if you do have that balance then the competitive it doesn't overtake you but then you can still use it to like you said kind of spur you on and not fall into complacency yeah. and kind of have that that bar to to measure up to and mm. so i think that's really cool yeah. um, do you feel like for you you said you feel like in cards like playing card games at the shop that's where mm-hmm. you feel like you kind of get some competitiveness i i mean i can think of circumstances in our life together where we've like played beach volleyball and you get really competitive with that <laughs> so i can i can see the competitiveness i know that I don't know if I've really experienced your competitiveness in the card shop because usually when we Mm -hmm. play against each other, it's just you winning all the time. (laughs) So I don't think I mean that's that that is a form of competitiveness though, like never, never taking it easy or you know never. That's true. Yeah. Well, yeah. 
you know, because I I've played against people where it's like, you know, they're like, I'm in it for fun. I'm like, that's cool. Have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna play to win. Yeah, right. So, um, you know, it's definitely. I think even when you're taking it easy, which mm. you know, there's still like that competitive nature and edge, and yeah. there's just different types of people, and that's fine too. But like, I'm never gonna like play worse against somebody or like try to mm. you know if there's some sort of agreed competition i'm never going to try to like sandbag to you know help them win or whatever yeah. you know like yeah. i try to be nice and encourage them and show them like how to do better but at the end of the day like and i mean yeah i would say i'm trying to think of like some area where i wouldn't be like out to win but i'm like even like a family game night or something like i'm <laughs> doesn't matter what it is i'm out to win so <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, man. but specifically, so like in the card game sphere, it's, um, mm -hmm. like, cause I've been looking at what makes successful people and, mm. you know, it's, um, cause I'm going to be going to a, a big event in November, uh, in San Jose. Card game, like a world. Card game event or? Mm hmm Yeah. It's um, nice. like part of the world championship and they're having a few like different side events and stuff. Ooh. So I'm going to be going, uh, Ooh. yeah, San Jose. And, That's cool, uh, man. Yeah, I'm really excited. Uh, but, you know, you kind of, like, look at people, and, I mean, I'm sure you see this maybe in athletes and stuff and, like, those kind of uh, fields as well. But, you know, what separates a successful person from the just person that's treats it as a hobby, basically, you know? And a lot of it is, I don't know, because I used to have the mindset you could kind of be... Uh, a one-man team or something you know it's like well if you just have the natural talent and you have like the drive anything's possible you can just put your mind to it you can do it mm. and just looking at like successful people in this field that i'm trying to be more successful in uh they all just surround themselves with equally competitive people and just practice <laughs> mm -hmm. and just play play talk it through you know it's the iron sharpening iron thing, you know, where it's like those are the successful people, the ones that surround themselves with equally competitive people and really just like push themselves to improve. And mm. so that's kind of like, I've always known that that's like a good thing, but now that I actually like want to be successful and like there's something that's worth being successful at in my mind, mm. it's like in a lot of ways it's making me be serious about how I approach it and mm -hmm. saying, okay, that like objectively works for people. So I have, if I want to be successful, I have to step into this pattern essentially to improve. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. it's been like a cool, and I have found, you know, equally competitive people and since playing with them, I think I've like probably improved drastically more than I would have otherwise. So, mm. um, yeah do you feel competitive in your kind of line of work at all or is that i don't know that, like, i don't think i feel more? yeah i don't think i feel as competitive as i was when i first started out i feel like i'm pretty mm -hmm. established and feeling very confident about the work that i do now i think when yeah. i first started and i kind of felt like i needed to make it or prove myself or whatever i think i mm -hmm. felt like oh i've really gotta be ambitious and work hard and show people i'm like better than other people or whatever but I think now, yeah. I I don't know if that means I I made it. I don't know if there's any kind of thing <laughs> it's like that. It's all downhill but from I, here. I, yeah, it's all downhill. I don't know. I mean, I still work hard at stuff, but I don't like feel like I have to prove anything or I'm competing against other people. I think at this mm -hmm. point, I'm just sort of trying my best for my own sake. Like I probably achieve higher than the standard of what people expect, or at least I think I do. I don't know. And I think Is that, that a I, form of competitive competitiveness like expecting something from yourself well yeah like i'm competing with myself right now you know like mm -hmm. i'm not competing against other people so like if i do a good job at something like there's a lot of stuff in my work that i'll go the extra mile to do then i know it's not required of me but i'll do it just because i want to like i'll be kind of unhappy with myself if i don't do this extra step because i know that doing yeah. that step means i'm doing a good job and i want to do that i'm satisfied with my good job so i kind of compete with what I can achieve in my own ability. Is there any way you're competing with like the Brandon of yesterday, if that makes sense? 
Yeah, definitely. Definitely the Brandon of like several years ago. I mean, I think about that in my teaching or my private practice. There's so much mm -hmm. stuff that I look back and reflect, especially in sort of that milestone of like when I lived in California versus now living in Idaho. I think I definitely <laughs> compare back to like my old career path that I had a few years ago. And I mm -hmm. see that, oh, I used to do X, Y, and Z, and I didn't do these things very well. Now I'm kind of in a new chapter of my life. What are all the things I can improve? Write up mm -hmm. the list of ideas of how to do things better and try to accomplish those things, you know? Yeah. So I definitely compete with yesterday, Brandon. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's... But like you said, even that has limits of like what or would you say that has limits of like unhealthy and unhealthy competing with yourself? No, I think, well, I think that it can, but I feel like this is a healthier version of competition for me at least than when mm -hmm. I was comparing myself to other people. Because I think mm -hmm. when I compare myself to other people, it almost makes the other person like a bad guy. And it yeah. makes me feel like I, it's like I'm the winner, they're the loser. And I'm always, like I'll, I'll never be good enough because there'll always be somebody out there who's better. And then when I am better than them, then I like I've conquered over them. And it's sort of this like pride thing. And I yeah. feel like me competing like against myself, people. Yeah. I'm like, kind of like, I'm better than you as a person almost. And I don't really like want to think I, that like, way with people. Like my, my score is 45. Yours is only three. Like, yeah. Just, like ranking people or something. <laughs> Yeah, kind of like that, you know, and I don't really want my ambition to be built on like the dead bodies of people behind me, <laughs> you know, I don't want it to be built it... on like pushing people beneath me or something. Mm -hmm. So you is know? there any sort of like shame that or like pushing yourself down that comes from comparing yourself to past selves of being like, oh, well, I was a loser back then and some sort of, you know, maybe guilt or so if you're if you are comparing to yourself in the past yeah that's a good question i mean because you, you say if you do it to other people there's like a level of yeah you know pushing them down but if you're doing it to yourself are you pushing your past self down or i don't know i mean i don't know if i'm if i feel like i'm belittling or shaming myself in the past as much as just seeing how far i've come because like competing with myself makes me proud of myself and see that like gosh i'm so much better mm. than i used to be that's just the best I could do with where I was at at the time. And now I'm doing the best I can do with where I'm at today. And that's so much better than mm -hmm. where I was before because I worked hard in between to really build yeah. myself up and get smarter and improve skills and change with the way I did stuff. And I feel like it's almost a little bit humbling because it's like, dang, I got to this today from that like kind of crappy place where I began. Gosh, yeah. it's like, like I'm very thankful, you know, I've got like a lot of uh, things I can be grateful for, you know, it is kind of funny. That is one of those things. that's just a, uh, uh, highlights just how much perspective, uh, role perspective plays in <laughs> perception. You know, it's, someone could take that same situation, and completely flip it on its head and be, well, I'm, I just, I suck, you know, like mm. obviously, you know, I haven't, when I was that age, I have I obviously hadn't accomplished anything by that age. I didn't know anything. I was dumb, you know, like, or just it, depending on what you focus on and what, you know, your, your, yeah, where your focus lies is what <laughs> determines a lot of those feelings, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, yeah. um, and I'll be curious to hear what you, how you feel about this, but I think about people who are really ambitious or they've got some kind of goal and they're really competitive, like an Olympic athlete or somebody who's been trying to become a movie star. They're trying to get to that point where they've like made it, right? And then they mm -hmm. finally get the thing. They finally get the gold medal and they're standing on the podium, whatever it is. And then maybe you've heard of this before, after that happens, they're suddenly depressed, you know? Yeah, depression. I think it was, um, I think it was the guy who played Ron Weasley in Harry Potter I think that he got like horribly depressed when all the movies ended and it was like, I've done this my whole life. Like now what do I do? You know? Yeah. I think if you make from under you, exactly. If you make your identity based on what you're competing in and it's like, now that I'm the best, then mm -hmm. now what, what else do I do with my life? You know? 
And I think yeah. that that's one of the dangers of making, at least just making your identity your competition. But when you compete versus other people, I think it's easy to identify as now I'm better than everybody else. So where do I go? And like, oh, my life seems meaningless now. Versus well, if you're competing w- against yourself, you're always kind of have like more to improve in, you know? Yeah, because you're never going to get there. Well, Harry Potter is a weird one in itself because they, I mean, you take like a bunch of kids like who are, you know, still forming their identities you right. take them for like eight years or whatever nine years you like force yeah. not force them but like you have a very Pay clear a lot defined path for them <laughs> and then it's like all of a sudden you're like okay yeah we're done with you uh, yeah. good luck <laughs> have fun See in the real later. world yeah yeah so it's like what kid isn't going to be like a little bit messed up from that i don't know yeah yeah <laughs> for sure go hollywood do you feel like for you going into you know cards and when you play against people do you feel mm-hmm. like um like how much do you feel like it affects you in terms of the rest of your life like if you play a game and you win are you like stoked for the next couple of days that like yeah i won a couple of games and i feel really good right now versus if you mm-hmm. lose do you feel like you go home from that tournament or that whatever you know your little game with a few people or however you're playing whatever circumstance do you go home from that and it's like oh shoot i lost now i feel crappy about my life or just other things how do you feel like well, that little, affects you i'm a little biased because i just won a big tournament so oh gotcha. <laughs> I feel very stoked yeah yeah um yeah and uh uh i think it's been a great a great learning tool um i definitely i've always taken losses pretty hard but mm. I think that's part of the just learning is like being realizing why you lost, what the factors are, and then how to move forward from it in a healthy way. So that's like, I think I've been working in sportsmanship my whole life just cause like, I do like being in competitive s- spheres and I don't want to be like the person that makes people feel bad for like when I win or they lose or whatever, or when mm. I lose or be a sore loser. So, yeah. um, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm definitely emotionally tied up in it. And I'm, I always wonder if that's, cause like, if you weren't, then would you even be competitive? You know, mm. like, would it even matter? Like, it's, so it's more about harnessing that drive, I would say, mm. and using the emotional feel as it were to, to give you the motivation, I guess, to, to actually improve. Cause if you didn't care, it would just be like, you would just go into each game and like after you lost, you'd be like, okay, whatever. You wouldn't have that kind of like fire under your butt to, to be mm. like, okay, well, what can I do better next time? You know, so that doesn't happen. Or what can I, you, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't reminisce on it anywhere at uh, any at all, because you wouldn't have like an emotional driver or feeling of like discomfort, I guess. <laughs> and so, mm. um, and then, so, I mean, there's also, so it's like a, Ooh, thank you. It's almost like a, out for a second. Hold on. Yeah. Still there. Let's... I lost your, yep. your video. Oh, okay. I see your back. See me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't see you, but I can keep talking to you. I don't know. Okay. I think it's going, um, um but yeah, so it's like a twofold thing, of yeah. both the trying to avoid like the negative feeling of losing. And also the the benefit of uh, of winning and like the high of winning, you know. So it's like you get twofold emotional reinforcement, I guess. Yeah. In that way. Yeah. And so using that that fuel, and I think what matters is like that's a great fuel to use and a great motivator, mm. and it makes it makes improving a lot easier than just if you had to like improve at something you didn't care about or weren't emotionally invested in. Mm. It's like someone told you to become a better mechanic. You'd be like, uh, okay, you like might read a Google article or something, but it's not going to be like, you know, it's not going to be, you're not going to be passionate about it or care about it. Right. So you wouldn't learn as much as you otherwise would have. Whereas if you are competitive in an area, then you're like getting all these emotional reinforcements that are going to like propel you, I guess, mm. as long as you're channeling them in a good way, I think. You know, it's interesting because I I definitely feel like the emotional component, you know, like what actually defines somebody as being competitive? Like, because if you were Mm -hmm. playing a game, like you were saying, 
and you were totally neutral. It's like, eh, I could win, I could lose, whatever. <laughs> it's interesting because I wouldn't consider that to be competitive. I would say that you're just neutral, like you don't really care. But yeah. it's interesting because if you don't care, like you're saying, you probably won't be ambitious enough to try to learn and become good at it. But what if you're already really good at something and you train yourself to have that sort of neutral disposition? And I think about that because back when we used to play a lot of beach volleyball, I know, especially in like a physical sport, but I think it applies too in like chess or especially poker, right? If you get nervous or you get really <laughs> emotional in poker, you're tilted and you lose it, you know? But yeah. it's like, if you have the skills to play well, and if you can try to control that emotional competitiveness, you can be really neutral and level-headed. I feel like that makes you play or compete even better than before. I don't know. What do you think about that? Hmm. It's like you need the, the competitiveness to drive you to be good. But once you're good, you almost need to, like, not be as competitive in order to, like... Like not get that. like stressed or to lose it or choke up in the middle of a game, you know? Yeah, that that would be the balance I'd be thinking about is like, yeah, you have to, I guess, yeah, maybe that's a good way of putting it is taking down the emotion to the level where it doesn't hinder your, your ability, I guess. Or there could be an argument for like timing of, um, so you you know you have the you kind of suppress the emotions almost in the moment and mm. then like you're saying be that more neutral self and then afterwards let yourself feel everything mm. and then use that to drive you to improve for next time and so yeah. like, when you're in the actual situation be more level-headed and like okay i'm not going to be like learning right now i'm trying to apply everything i've learned like mm. this is the time for that to apply and then afterwards be like you know you feel that fire of competitiveness or the emotions or whatever and you're like okay i'm gonna use that to now uh feel my learning and like dive in more yeah and so maybe there's something I like could, that i could also see like in the example of poker i could see how you really have to be level-headed you can't get emotional with it or you lose but mm -hmm. i could see with other sports maybe like if you were in a race like a triathlon or something you know you've mm -hmm. got to get that you've got it i think you need to be competitive and emotional about it because it keeps you sort of pumped and energized right and that yeah. that's a game where you have to keep your motivation for like you know hours and hours of running and biking and swimming and if yeah. you lose motivation you lose your will to continue then you'll mm -hmm. you'll poop out and you'll quit early or you'll slow down or whatever but if you stay competitive and you keep the blood running and your to emotions get high going. keep keep the adrenaline going then you'll really want to you know push yourself harder and go through to the end so i can see how that more yeah. competitive spirit really needs to amp up in that type of condition dude i could imagine like someone in a race you know it's like you're running and then you're like kind of slowing down you're out in front of the pack and then you see someone's like back in front of you <laughs> like come in front of you yeah and you're just like not today <laughs> just right. like double down you know you're like it just gives you like that extra fire you need <laughs> yeah totally i there's this little spin bike that i'll use at the gym every once in a while when i want to do my cardio and mm -hmm. it's got this big screen on it and it's basically like gamifying uh mm. doing the spin bike where you have like an actual track and you go up and down hills and it's like the countryside of italy or whatever and it actually Fancy. will show your little biker person going the speed on the track that you're going on the bike and mm. they'll actually have these like artificial simulated other bikers on the track who are always going kind of a set speed and they just sort of like appear around random turns and bends and and you'll see them way off in the distance and it's not a real person it's just like art you know just ai basically in the game in the computer yeah. game thing well, computer but when you see the back of that person ahead of you you're like I need to get around that guy right now. <laughs> Even though you're not really racing against it, it just makes you feel more competitive. And so then I get better times. Yeah. And it's just, it's funny because I know that the people who made this this program <laughs> just like use psychology to trick me and make me get more fit, you know? But it's like, mm -hmm. I, I know it, I know what it is. I know it's not real, but I still get that weird urge in me to like be competitive and beat the little ghost computer thing, you know? Yeah. 
gotta hack your biology. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's that sums up a lot of my thoughts on uh, competitiveness. Do you have uh, if there's anything you want to bring to the table with in, in, things that inspire you or things that you've been thinking about? I'll give you some time before. Yeah. Um, no, no. Actually, I did have something I was thinking about. I've been reading this book recently, um, which is very interesting. It's called Give and Take by Adam Grant. Mm. And it's all about the difference between people who want to just take everything that they can get in life. And so whenever they get an opportunity to make more money or if they can scam people or if you're like, you know, oh, I'll, I'll buy you something and they don't want to reciprocate. I don't know, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and how if you're a taker, that's sort of a short term solution in life. Like you might get some extra stuff. You might get some things in the moment. But long term, you'll lose your friends. You'll get a bad reputation. People don't want to work with you. There's a lot of stuff that in like the long run in life or in business, that doesn't really work out. Like versus if out you're, on. Yeah, you lose out on a lot of opportunities. Versus if you're a generous person and you want to give to people, then giving makes people like you. You get a good reputation. You get a good network. People want to reciprocate and give back to you. It really mm -hmm. builds like the kind of longevity you need in life to gain something, whatever your goal is, to gain something in the long run you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years later. And yeah. I've, I've been thinking about that lately because there's been several things in my life where I've been either observing generosity in other people and seeing how it pays them back, or even in my own life when I've been trying to do something extra generous. Um, I'll use a couple examples here just from business. In my office uh, back in Santa Barbara, I used to do these clinical assessments with people and I would charge people like $150 for 90 minutes and that was a lot of money up front it's your first appointment you make and I do this whole clinical evaluation and it was like a really steep sort of expectation like well if I paid this guy all this money he'd better deliver on his value and sometimes I'd have a hard time with people where it was like almost too much money for them and they were apprehensive about seeing me well mm -hmm. then when I changed my practice and I came up here to Idaho I said you know what I just want to be generous with people. I don't really want to do that. I want it to be a little bit less stressful. I'm going to make my whole clinical evaluation that I used to charge 150 bucks for totally free. Not going to make people pay me at all for it. Just come on in. It's good to meet you. I just want to learn some stuff about you. See if I can help you or not. Just really casual about it. Low stress, yeah. really easy. And people are always blown away that I just gave that to them for free. And I've mm -hmm. realized that when I do that, when I'm super generous up front, it makes them trust me. They like me. They feel like they already got good value. They're like, they wow, like if this guy, you. they feel like they owe me. No, it's true. They want to reciprocate. You know, some people have like offered to pay me for those. And I'm like, no, 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 it's just free. Like, I just want to give you good service. Don't worry about it. And mm -hmm. then those people are way more likely to give me referrals. They want to see me for more follow-up appointments than the people used to. Like it's been mm -hmm. way better business for me. And even though it costs me a little bit upfront right now, I know that building my business long-term, that generosity is really going to pay off in the long-term by building good clientele and reputation and making people like me a lot better. And it's crazy. It's like, I didn't change my service. All I did was just be slightly more nope, generous with it froze. than before. And it's totally changed stuff, you know? Yeah. And another example is there's this place that I've, I've gone to over in Liberty Lake where they do boba, you know, those like boba tea things. And if you go there, the first time you go there, they work so hard to make it perfect. They like <laughs> will sit there for like 10 minutes. And I went there with my wife and they literally gave her like three different drinks fully made everything like 16 ounces handed her the drink each one's worth like six bucks and she was like no this one doesn't it's not really the flavor i want and they're like that's okay we'll throw it away we'll make a new one for you and then she and then they were like okay what about this one is it too sweet and they were asking it's not like she was telling them they were like how about okay here's our next one is it too sweet not sweet enough how do you feel about it and, and they're, they're like like next month there's like, well, actually we did look it up later and Boba's like ridiculously cheap. So they're not really throwing away that much, but you know, just the time they would spend yeah. and the fact they would be really nice about it, like really nice customer service. And it's then like, gesture, the, yeah. it's a really good gesture, you know? And then the first couple times that we went there when we were like, Oh, it's our first time and it's our second time. They just gave it all to us for free. 
like they were super generous, way more than like a normal fast food kind of go through the drive through, like pick up your coffee. Like normally people aren't that generous. Mm -hmm. And I've learned by talking to other people and repeat visits that that's just how they treat everyone. And they're <laughs> crazy busy. I know tons of people who go there and everyone loves it and their ratings on Google, everything's super high. So it's really opened my eyes that like, gosh, I have, I have live too much of my life as a taker you know i should spend so much more time in my life giving to other people now that i've been the recipient of generosity and seen how much it blesses me and when mm -hmm. i give to other people and i see how it blesses them and it was still like the win-win for me in the end yeah. and it's like gosh generosity really is i can't think of cases when generosity like could maybe go wrong i mean maybe you cross a boundary you give people like all your money and they scam you somehow i don't know i mean maybe you could be naive about something but do you feel yeah. like for you there's times in your life where you were being really generous with people and it paid you back in some way oh 100 times uh 100 percent, yeah um i think it it's a lot of work stuff uh where that happens where you know you i don't know for instance like people i do a lot of like freelance or not freelance but like uh just tired at work and so okay. someone will be, you know, like, oh, I need my yard trenched or mulched or something. And I'll be like, okay, well, I work at big this rental equipment place. I'll just, uh, I'll pick up the equipment for you. I'm like no extra charge or whatever. I'll just bring it to you and like, you can pay me for the work and I'll just bring it to you. And you know, it's like, like, really? Like, I don't have to pay you to like deliver it. I'm like, no, nah, I'm getting off work there anyway. It's all good, you know? Hmm. And people usually try to tip me or pay me like twice as much as what I like quoted them at or you uh -huh. know whatever so it's like it just instantly because I don't charge a lot either that's like the other thing is like I'd be like no nah, I'm just like you know I just want to meet people and get out there and do work so and people are like well I respect that so like let me give you 200 bucks for you know a couple hours of work and I'm like hmm. are you sure and people are like you know so I think to your point ge generosity breeds generosity mm. and the other thought was you were saying like how can it bite you and i think the biggest area where it bites you is um which is why it doesn't happen as much i guess in probably like a more uh structured setting of like society is it has to do with like boundaries i would say mm. so like i think generosity without boundaries is kind of dangerous um at least knowing your own boundaries, um, which is why it works better in like society. Cause there's already kind of like rules, um, you know, and people aren't going to like overly give in a lot of, uh, it's kind of nuanced, but like people won't give as much maybe emotionally or people, mm -hmm. people hold something back, I guess, when you're like dealing with just random people and interactions and like in society, people like kind of hold back a little bit already, which is kind of a form of boundaries, I would say. Mm -hmm. So like when you're being generous there, even you're not like, you're not giving all your money away because you don't know the person, you know, yeah. whereas like, where I think it gets really sticky is like when you are emotionally invested with somebody or they gain your trust and then it's like, they're like, dude, I just need like $2,000 and you're like, mm. you know, that normal, if it was just a stranger, your normal brain's like, no, not a chance. Like, <laughs> what do you need $2,000 for? <laughs> like, yeah. I don't even know you. But when you're like in a close relationship or it's somebody that's like gained your trust, then it's like some of those red flags go away and it's like, yeah, I mean, like, I care about you, your family, like, all right. And then, you know, later you figure out they were manipulating you or you got burned or mm. something, you know? Yeah. So I would say it's like a boundary thing in a lot of ways, but, um, you yeah. know, that brings up another good thought with boundaries. I think that that can also lead to people, especially in the parent child relationship, people growing up being entitled and feeling like mm -hmm. they can get whatever they want because the parents are like overly generous and they don't let people have hard times. You know, they don't let their yeah. kids like have the, the difficulties that help them grow. So I can mm -hmm. see that that's, that's, and I actually don't even necessarily think that that's truly being generous. I think that's possibly immaturity or a lack of wisdom on the part of the parents. And I think that that's parents not wanting the disapproval of their kids. Yeah. So they don't like doing anything that makes their kids um, not appreciate them or love them. It's like, oh, I'll trying buy to, you the pony if you tell me you love me yeah. kind of thing, you know? Or they're trying or, to insulate themselves from negative 
uh, like emotions coming from their child. Yeah, yeah. So I, I do. Th that, that's another thing that it could look like generosity. Like, oh, mm -hmm. you're such a loving parent. You give your kids whatever they want, and it's like, no, they should have like had some difficult time so they could grow up with that and like become a mature human being instead of just a pampered, entitled human being. Well, and then they might become. You know, that's what breeds the next generation of takers is right. that, yeah. that kind of behavior. And then it's, then they're the ones who are likely to, you know, actually pull the manipulation on somebody else, um, you know, like loved one or friend or whatever. That's true. So you're just kind of like, by, like you said, looking generous, you're setting up the next generation of taker people. Yeah. And so, huh. Yeah. That's a, it's an interesting thought. I definitely... I definitely like the generosity portion of it. And I think like, that's a very real like ingrained pattern, I guess, in, mm. in how life works. Like it's, it's almost like a law of nature, you know, in a sense, but more of a, like a moral one or something, I guess. Mm. But huh. yeah. yeah, it's uh, so what, so was it just your idea of changing? Was it your idea of generosity that sparked doing like free clinics and stuff, or was it something else you'd read? Or no, yeah, it was that idea of generosity, um, and I had already kind of read that in some other stuff, like with marketing techniques and business ideas, and and also mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, I really want to get back to the heart of what I'm trying to do with my clinical practice, and I want to make it something that's about giving to people and really helping them with their their health. And not just mm -hmm. about me like making a paycheck and getting a bunch of money from them, which is yeah. easier to do now that I'm in Idaho and overhead for business expenses is way lower. <laughs> so it's like, I don't need to make as much money. So that really takes a lot of pressure off. But I think that I came into the business with that idea in this new chapter mm -hmm. of life. And so that's really set the pace for me all the way through. And that's made it, I think, better for me, better for them. Um, it's just that willingness to like not get that upfront money and realize that, you know what, eventually money will probably come through later on with having a more successful business. But right now I'm building it in ways that's being very generous. And then how do I make sure that I carry that mindset of generosity all the way through my business from beginning to end? And I don't get to some point where I'm like, Oh, I'm super busy. I'm going to like, raise my rates super high and I'm not going to be nice to people anymore because like, look at me, I'm really successful or something. How do I make mm -hmm. sure? So maybe this is, this video is a time capsule. I'll have to come back and watch it again. But you know, how do I make sure that I don't lose that sense of generosity and I keep myself focused on it and I don't just be like, Oh, I had a rough day. I don't want to be nice to people anymore. You know, that's, yeah. that's something that I'm, I'm trying to hold on to right now is that reminder, that focus of long term value of a character that I appreciate in the moment and I have to remember five years from now kind of thing, you know, it almost reminds me of, um, just investing in general or mm. you're, you know, investing in this mindset and this way of being that, you know, if you put a bunch of money into an investment, you might not see returns the first year, you know, you might not see re returns the second year, but it's like knowing it's the right thing and sticking with it you start to like get dividends, you know, and it's like, or yeah, I guess with comparing it more to dividends, it's like the first year you only get 5% extra or whatever, you know, and then, mm. but now you have, instead of investing a hundred dollars, now you have 105 and then that gets, you know, then you get 5% on that and then you have 210 and you know, it's the compounding effect of, yeah. of dividends where, you know, if you are putting effort into this system of being and like being generous, it's like, you know, I think it is almost an exponential thing where it just continues to like expand past what you can expect <laughs> in a lot yeah. of ways. And so you end yeah. up getting new connections and, you know, like you said, people want to work with you. And so then they refer you to other people and you get like, I think that's how you get really big networks. Honestly, mm. one question I will have for you though, <laughs> that might be, I don't know if you have any thoughts on it, but. So when you like look at, for instance, like politicians or like very, you know, Jeff Bezos or something, mm -hmm. like, would you say, cause they like look very successful on the surface, but people like very much often accuse them of not being generous or like, mm -hmm. you know, with their employees, with their dealings with other people, 
all that kind of stuff. Do you think there's any sort of like, like generosity is like the is only way, or is it like it looks like they're kind of backstabbing people, you know, to get where yeah. they, to get where they are. I I think that they fall prey to um, a common thing for a lot of people when they're successful. I think a lot of people, and this goes back to what I was saying, that I need to make sure I, I stay true to myself in the long run. I think people start off generous, they become mm-hmm. successful, and then once they're like, I made it, I am successful, like people respect me, I can do whatever I want because I am <laughs> lord of the Amazon company, whatever it is, then I think people let it go to their head, they become selfish mm-hmm. and prideful, and they stop being generous and instead they go back to being a taker again. And hmm. if you read um, the book, People Over Profit, it's a fascinating book that kind of talks about the cycle of businesses where they start off being sort of like true to their promise and they're honest people who want to give to other people. Then mm-hmm. they become successful and they start looking at how they can become the most efficient company they can be. They're like, how do I reach more people or make more money or how do we use efficiency? Mm-hmm. And then in the act of trying to become efficient, they start cutting corners, doing some dishonest things. They sort of like become takers. And then they have to go to this section where it all falls apart. And it's like, oh no, we apologize. I'm sorry, we made a mistake. Corporate restructuring. Corporate restructuring, (laughs) you gotta fire people, whatever it is. And then that kind of brings them back to the place of like, we repent, I'm sorry, humility. (laughs) Now we'll like go back to our true purpose again and how they sort of go in the cycle, you know? Yeah. And then they and so, achieve some new height because they did that and everyone's like, oh, we forgive you, we'll shop at Amazon again. And they make yeah. ro- record sales that, that year and then they're like, ooh, all right, what can we, yeah. Yeah. Can we exploit this time. Exactly. Yeah. And so the real lesson in life is like, how do you just never leave that initial starting point of, you know, being true to yourself and your generosity and giving to people and, You know, I even think about that in like the biblical sense of the Old Testament with the children of Israel, where God would be like, okay, here's what you're supposed to do. Stay committed to me. Here's the laws and like how you're supposed to live your lives. Like you guys agree to that? They're like, yeah, we agree. For three years we do. Yeah. For like uh, (laughs) until Moses dies and then we don't care anymore, you know? And then they just went through this cycle. The whole Old Testament is just a cycle over and over again. And they had stuff like that, written in stone and then the generation <laughs> dies and the next generation grows up and they're like, we don't care about those stones. Like we rebel. Yeah. You know? That's what I, that was my next question actually was, do you think it is something you can live in or do you think it is a cycle for everybody? You know, cause it's like, yeah. And, I, and embracing the cycle and like embracing it to the point where you move through it faster, I guess or spend like less time in the wilderness as a metaphor? Like, do you think that's where it's better to be? Yeah, I really do think that it's always a cycle for people. Like, I think that it's, I I think that it's impossible to always be that perfect place where you're totally in line with stuff and you're like never falling out of that a little bit. I think that we always drift slightly and it's about making sure that there's people in your life who can see the drift or you have some way of sort of auto-correcting with an experience or something that you do on a regular basis that makes you check in again with your values. And I think that it's really about minimizing the drift each time you go through it so that that way it's less of a mistake, less of this whole repentance thing and coming back. Less of a disaster. Exactly. It's like you drift way down here and you bring yourself back. Then hopefully next time you drift just a little ways down and it's like, just Mm -hmm. make the drift slightly less each time. I think that's the goal. I think that's a very achievable thing and a probably a positive thing to end on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. So we got to be competitive about our generosity. That's what I'm hearing. Yep. <laughs> and curb, curb your drift. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's right. the takeaway. Yeah. <laughs> Each time. <laughs> oh, and, and it's man. been a real pleasure chatting and uh, we'll see you. Uh, I guess we'll see everybody on episode two. Yeah, that's right. I hope people were inspired today. Thanks for listening, everybody. Absolutely. All right. Have a good one. Later.